He had no difficulty with this at all. Because what happened would be like the waves of the something are coming down here, and they shake, and they just keep going, but some of them will bounce back. Something like a sandbar sometimes partially reflects the waves in the sea. So some of the energy went back. But the waves don't operate this thing. By the way, when you turn the light on, this might go off at any moment. You don't have to wait for a certain length of time. Of course, there's odd that it goes off at any instant, but it could accidentally go off the moment you open the slit. So it's not a question of waiting for the energy of the wave to pile up or anything. It's hopeless. I have to start with light is particles. Waves explain many things, but not light. It's particles, okay? okay. It's photon. The problem is they have reflected with probability. Now, the next feature, having to do with reflection again, that I would like to describe is something that you're all so familiar with, perhaps not so directly, but perhaps you've seen the colors in soap bubbles. It's made out of soap water, which has no color. No color, I've seen the colors. Mix it together, get a lot of soap water together and look at it. No color. You take oil, which is a sort of a yellow fluid, you know, and you, it drips with blackish yellow junk. It drips out of an automobile on a rainy day. You must have experience here with that. And you look at the puddles to your delight, there are colors. Colors. These colors are produced by reflections from two surfaces near each other, very close together. If the surfaces are far apart, we'll discuss it later. The same phenomenon really occurs, but it's much harder to see under normal circumstances. What happens there is that in a soap bubble, for example, there's a layer of water. And so we have two surfaces at some distance from one another, so. And then the photon can either come down here and reflect right away, or it can come down this way and reflect from back there. Okay? Now, as it turns out, it's about the same percent. If it's just water between air and air, it's about the same 1 in 25 both times. What's the color? If I'm going to do it with monochromatic light, that light of one color, what can you see in color? What you see on an oil film on a mud puddle or in a soap bubble when you use light of exactly one color is not colors but bands bright and dark band. Places where the light is reflected very well and places where it's not reflected at all across the bubble. Now, the different, the position of those bands, if you first looked at a bubble with red light, you see bands black and, black and red, black and red, band all over. You look at it with blue light, you also see blue and white, blue and black, blue and black bands. But the pattern is not the same. They're displaced from the where the red ones were. And so when you have both red and blue, you get purple and red and black and purple and so on. Now, if you add to that yellow with its pattern and so forth, you get all these colors from mixing, okay? So we're going to simplify experimentally, as, I, as Newton did, and look at these, uh, this reflection. What Newton, uh, most of his experiments, he did this clever way. He had a beautiful curved piece of glass, which was a lens and a flat piece and put them next to each other and then this was only a very slight curvature and so he had this gap between the two and when he sh shone light this way and looked at reflected light which depending on where you looked see this is a cross section of the lens which is more completely like that there is some reflection in here which is irrelevant at the moment there's another glass plate down here when he looked in different places, the light came down all over, and when he looked in different places, he was looking at cases that corresponded to reflection with one gap or another gap between the sides. And when he looked at this with monochromatic light, looked down on it, since it was a circular, a spherical lens, he saw in what I call bands in the soap bubble, but more organized, he saw rings, called Newton's rings, with a black area starting and then red, if it was red light he was using, and black, red, and so forth. These looked like they were coming closer and closer together, but he was a clever man and understood immediately what it meant. If he measured the distance from here to here and plotted the answer for whether it's red or dark against this distance, not against this, instead of measuring away from the center, he measured how far apart these plates were. Then he found, like our friends the Mayans, every time you had 365 points, they got blank. In other words, if this was black and this was red, then double that distance was black again. 
and yes, and triple the distance was red, and four times the distance was black, and five times the distance was red, and so on, nice and even. In other words, instead of measuring by this distance, by measuring the thickness, you find the following experimental result. Reflection coefficient against thickness between the two layers. Okay? The spacing between, in this case, if it's an oil film bubble, with that, that's the distance. In this case, it's the spacing between the lens and the plate. And if you could change it, it's harder to change in a soap bubble under control, but it changes automatically as it dries out. You get the following. You get no reflection if the thickness is zero, then you get a strong reflection for a certain thickness, and then if you make it thicker, you get no reflection, you get a thickness. The reflection, then you get no reflection, you get no reflection, and so on, so on, and now, and now it's getting thicker and thicker. Does this go on forever? Yep. <laughs> if you got good enough monochromatic light and get the experiment under control, you can make it go almost indefinitely. You can make this work for distances of a meter or more. Still, catch it, keeping track, whether it's even odd, even odd, bump, bump, bump. Okay? There's nothing that's interesting, very interesting. But you know, that's damning. Why? Because what theory were you figuring for the reflection from that that made the reflection be 4%? The odds, 4%, whatever. You put another layer down here at the right thickness, expecting to get 8%, and you get nothing. How does the layer down here turn off the reflection from the layer up here? Or if you figure that out, and you make the layer just a little thicker, it doesn't turn it off, but in fact, the reflection is more than twice. On this scale here, this line would have been what you would have expected if you expected it always to be 4% plus 4% or 8% from the two surfaces. This is what you would have got if you disregarded all this nonsense that actually happened. But common sense, it reflects with a certain odds, and it reflects from the other surface with a certain odds, and so altogether you got twice as many coming back. This is the twice as many. But for some, if the thickness is zero, you don't get anything. If the thickness, hey, that's not such a bad idea, is it? If you don't have any water there at all, you wouldn't get any reflection. Starts out right anyway. <laughs> well, that theory was kind of dumb now that I come to think of it. And that helps to explain Newton's observation when the distance is too small, the light doesn't know anything about it. If the thickness is sufficiently small, it doesn't reflect. It does exactly the same as if there's nothing there. But the horror of it is, <laughs> it's all right that it increases as the thickness goes up, but it overshoots, you see. <laughs> and then it comes back to zero again when the thickness is just right. It's very difficult to invent a probability thing. If I had these spots on this surface, it's very hard to see how you're going to have spots on this surface, which turns the spots on that surface off when they're the right distance away. And so Newton went a little bit nutty. <laughs> and he talked about fits of reflection and transmission and so forth. And I would like to now just finish this by telling you what is the answer. Hmm? Now here's the answer. This is the way we figure this out. It goes as follows. What we're going to calculate is a probability. The probability of a particular question. And then a probability that this counter goes off. The probability that if I had one photon coming down, it'll come back to this counter. The probability, which is measured by this curve. And here's the way that the rule is for finding the probability. Now listen, hold your seats. Now hold on. Don't be afraid. Just, just go along, all right? Never mind it, don't like it, huh? Just hold on. It works like this. What you do is you take a piece of paper, a piece of paper, it has nothing to do with the original thing. The piece of paper is only made marks on it. It's got nothing to do with the light. Right? <laughs> and it has your following rules. That you make an arrow to represent, well, for each reflection, you make an arrow. This arrow, for example, is for the reflection from the front surface, and this arrow might be the reflection from the back surface. And I'll tell you in a minute how to make those arrows. And then what you do is you tie the arrows together this way. You make one, and then